Welcome, everyone. We'll call the Senate Education Committee to order. We have lots of visitors today, so we welcome you who have uh, come to uh, discuss this particular and, and give testimony on this particular issue. Uh, we'll begin today by, uh, in fact, Lynette, if you take a silent roll for us, it looks like we have a quorum. We'll begin today by uh, the presentation of Senate Bill 1038. And we'd ask Senator Nichols and Senator uh, Lenny if he would come forward to the podium and lead us through that legislation. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee. Um, my name is Senator Tammy Nichols. I'm from District 10. And uh, I am presenting to you today how, uh, Senate Bill 1038. Today we are here to speak on the merits of Senate Bill 1038, the Freedom and Education Savings Account, or ESA. ESAs provide families with greater educational opportunities and choices. ESAs like Senate Bill 1038 have been used in other states as a mechanism to provide families with new options for their children's education. Children should not be put in a box because one size doesn't fit all. Every child is unique and so is their educational experience. ESA accounts help families because they are flexible and can be used to cover educational expenses for tutoring, textbooks, and educational materials and reduce the financial burden that comes with their cost. Additionally, many families are unable to afford private or uh, other types of school tuition or the cost associated with virtual or schooling at home. Senate Bill 1038 expands those options to more families as it is available to children in grades K through 12 who are eligible to enroll in a public school. Senator Lenny and I are going to be giving a detailed overview of what the bill does, so I will turn it over to him to start that review. And we know we have many here who want to testify and want to make sure we leave time for them, but we will be happy to address any questions during our presentation or the bill or after the testimony to you. Thank you, Senator Nichols, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Brian Lenny, Senator uh, from District 13 from the great city of Nampa, Idaho. Um, so we're just going to go just section by section, kind of hit some of the highlights in the actual bill itself, not to get too bogged down on details, but just some things we think are important. So let's get right into it. So uh, starting with definitions, page 1, line 14, this is... Uh, section 33-6601. A couple things I wanted to highlight here. Um, line 18, uh, which is which is the number two there, department means the Department of Education. So the entity charged with overseeing this account is the State Department of Education. Uh, as far as administration and the funds, the actual money piece of it, that's overseen by the Treasury. If we go down to line 24, number five, qualified school means a non-governmental primary or secondary school that is located in the state. So that means um, it, essentially any school or school model uh, located in the state, then that they do not have to be an accredited school, just like private schools and charter school, or not charter schools, excuse me, private schools, home schools, things like that. They currently function on their own without um, any interference from the state. So that's qualified uh, schools there. Going down to line 26, qualified student, means a resident of the state who is eligible to enroll in a public school in this state in any, uh, essentially a K through 12 student. So any student who is a qualified to be a K through 12 student in Idaho qualifies um, for this, which kind of naturally leads us to the second section funding. So if this is 30, section 33-6602. Again, just hitting some of the highlights because there there's a lot of people and a lot of questions, so we don't want to take too much time. but. Um, line 34, this, this kind of sets up, um, I'll just read it. To enroll a qualified student for a freedom in education savings account, the parent of the qualified student must sign an agreement to do all of the following. 
and I, th I think the important one, because there is, uh, I've, heard, I've heard this mentioned sometimes, um, so if we go to page two, line three, this is one of the things a, a parent of a qualified student is required to do, to not enroll the qualified student in a school district or charter school. So this, this is a, um, it's an either or thing. So if you like your school, you can keep your school. Um, so your, a, a qualified K through 12 student can remain in public school or charter school or take advantage of these education savings account. They can't do both because then the state would be double dipping and paying, paying twice. So I thought that was important to highlight. Um, then if we go down to line 15, page two, line 15, uh, under subsection C, to use monies deposited, so this is one of the things the parents, uh, when a parent chooses to opt into this program because it is an opt-in program, not an opt-out program, they have to agree to use monies deposited in the Qualified Students Freedom and Education Savings Account for only the following expenses of the qualified student. And then, you know, it goes through the list there, tuition or fees at a qualified school, we've already defined that, textbooks, educational therapies, uh, tuition, um, the, you know, tutoring, teaching, curriculum, tuition or fees. But I thought what was really interesting, if you, so we can read the list there, just educational related expenses. But if you go down to line 39, um, one of the things that a parent of a qualified student can use these, uh, this money for is services provided by a public school, including individual classes and extra, extra, extracurricular programs. So similar to some of the programs we have now, maybe someone's a full-time homeschooler, but they want to take a certain class or a program that's offered by a, a public or a charter school, they can do that as well. Um, going down to line 45, again, page two, line 45. This, this is a big, uh, I've heard this out there, what's to, what's to stop a parent from taking this money? And it seems like the default kind of, um, the default thing they come up with is going to Best Buy and buying a, a flat screen. So this, this specifically says what these monies can and cannot be used on. So again, line 45, uh, computer hardware and technological devices primarily used for educational purposes, um, including calculators, personal computers, laptops, tablets, microscopes, telescopes, and printers. If you go to page three, at the top of the page it says it does not include, so they are not authorized, parents are not authorized to um, use this money on primarily non-educational devices, including televisions, telephones, video game consoles and accessories, home theater and audio equipment. So um, this, this, in my opinion, does eliminate a lot of the waste that, that would otherwise potentially be out there because it explicitly says what these funds can be used for and what they cannot be used for, um, which, you know, I would, I would posit that this is one of the tightest, cleanest uh, school choice bills out there because we very explicitly uh, delineated these things. Moving right along, um, page three, line 11, uh, this, this goes to the where does this money come from, and it's, it's some, so if we're looking at the, the chart on the screen here, um, that's, that's the sliver we're looking at, that uh, purple little sliver, that's what we're looking to take from the existing education budget. And I'm, I'm just going to read line 11, uh, starting on line 11 here, or I'm sorry, line 12. 80 per so this money comes from 80% of the most current available statewide average general maintenance and operations fund expenditures per full-time average daily attendance as calculated by the department. So with this uh, program with the Freedom and Education Savings Account, we're not, local money stays where it is. This doesn't touch taxes or levies or, or bonds or anything like that. Local money stays where it is currently, as we're speaking today. Federal money stays where it is, and non-M&O non, uh, money stays where it is. So we're taking 80% of the state M&O funds. Wrapping up my little section here, um, if you go to page four, on line four, sub uh, section 11 there, um, this talks about kind of what happens as, as a student graduates high school and how these accounts wind down. Um, it says, on the qualified student's graduation from, post -secondary from a post-secondary institution or after any period of four consecutive years after high school, and it goes on to essentially say that once someone is a senior in high school and they graduate high school, whatever's left in that account, they can 
whatever might be left over that, that would be potentially rolled over, they can use that in a post-secondary um, you know, college or school. And as soon as they graduate, that account closes. Um, any money left into it goes back to the state. Likewise, if a student graduates high school and say they're you know, 18 and by the time they're 22, they don't do anything with it, the account also closes and any money in that account goes back to the state. So that's kind of the definitions and funding piece. And I'm going to um, let Senator Nichols walk, uh, walk everyone through the rest of the bill. Thank you. All right, so you'll have this um, page in your packet, and I just wanted to walk through it really quick. So this is essentially how an ESA works. So just follow through with me. It's kind of um, juvenile in its, in its drawings, but uh, I think it gets the point across. So we have the community. This is where we all live. This is how we, we function, we, we know our neighbors, um, and we all pay taxes. And those taxes go to the state government. State government allocates money, and that um, part of that allocation goes to public education funds. So now we have the ESA program. It's going to be a digital platform. And so that program is put together, and the money uh, goes, that 80% that, that we were talking about, goes into the digital platform ESA. It's all, dig it's all digitally done. And then that money goes to the eligible students. And again, it's an annual enrollment. They have to apply. They have to stay eligible in order to be able to receive those funds. Once they're uh, on the program, then they have the options to be able to, to choose multiple school options that are available to them. I like to say it's kind of like your health savings account. So a lot of us have health savings accounts. And that money goes into our health savings account. We don't actually ever touch that money as far as tangible. Uh, it goes into the account, and then we can use it for health-related expenses. Very similar to what an ESA does. So the money is never actually physically touched by the individual. It goes into the account, and then that money can be utilized for many multiple education um, options. Now, I want to clarify one thing really quick. We hear a lot of the time that an ESA is a voucher. Vouchers and ESAs are very, very different. ESAs, uh, again, are like your health savings account. They can be used for multiple education expenses. A voucher is very limited. It's traditionally public dollars that go to private institutions. And so with an ESA, uh, like Senator Lenny was talking about, there's a multitude of different options that you can utilize for uh, uh, as expenses. Um, and some of our education options that we have. Now, one thing that COVID did do is it taught us that there are many types of ways to educate. We have online schooling, we have homeschooling, we have schooling at home, there is a distinction. We have public schools, we have charter schools, we have micro schools, we have co-ops. We have um, a wide array of school options. And one of the benefits with an ESA is that it creates innovation in education. And so we are seeing um, different types of educational opportunities because, again, our students are not one size fits all. So we're seeing a multitude of educational opportunities for them to be able to participate in. Uh, and Emmett, right now, they're uh, actually expanding on the traditional one-room schoolhouse where a group of parents can get together. They might have two, three, or four different grades, several students, and they together pool their money and hire a teacher. That teacher might make sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars or more, and uh, be able to teach, uh, have the flexibility to teach those students um, what what they're needing to learn. Um, and so, there's multiple educational opportunities that are out there right now. We'll continue on. So, from the school options, we go down to the annual, quarterly, and random audits. Again, this is a a um, provision that has been placed in this bill to make sure that we are we have accountability and transparency with the um, education dollars that are going to these families. So uh, annual audits can occur quarterly um, and quarterly audits can occur and they can be random. Um, again, also we also put together a, a provision where the attorney general, if there is any part that may stick out that there is um, things being done with these dollars that shouldn't be uh, utilized or spent on or someone's not qualifying or what have you, there is a provision for the Attorney General to be able to get involved in that. And then we move over to continue to use ESA. So as long as the student's eligible, they apply every year, 
uh, that money can roll over and they can continue to, to use the ESA program until they no longer qualify. And what that gives us is it gives us successful lives. We have uh, students that are able to partake of opportunities that they may not currently have within the current system. Uh, we f uh, believe that students should not be dictated uh, for their education based on the zip code that they live in because there's a lot of other opportunities out there. And what that does is it gives us a stronger society, a stronger communities. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, how the ESA works. Um, I'm going to continue to take you through the bill. If you'll go to page 4, um, line 13, section 33-6603, the administration, I wanted to just highlight some of the things on in that regard. And this is also not only administration, but the accountability component in there. So the State Department of Education will administer the following aspects of the program. They may adopt rules and policies necessary to govern the Freedom and Education Savings Account. And that is on page 4. Five, if you'll turn with me there, line 32. It also says that they will approve applications of qualified students, conduct or, contact or contract for audits of accounts, develop a participant handbook, implementing the digital platform, and refer suspected cases of fraud to the, to the Attorney General, among other things. The state treasurer will make deposits of money into the savings account. The treasurer may contract with private management firms to manage the account. And that can be found on page four, line 13. And if we go back on our, on our sheet uh, where we have the pie and it's split, yes, you can see we have a total of 45 million. 40 million of that, we have that split in half. So we have students who switch from public schools and uh, go into other types of education and then students that are already outside of education. And then we have $3 million that is for administrating the accounts. So that's administration costs. And then we have approximately $2 million that is for the digital platform implementation. So I want to make sure that that made sense as far as where we're getting the $45 million. So to continue, um, if we go to page 1, line 37, We see here that the department will send parents of qualified students of ESA contracts to sign, which include the following. And, uh, and so we have uh, line 37, uh, to use a portion of the Freedom and Education Savings Account, money is allocated annually to provide an education for the qualified student in at least the subjects of reading, grammar, mathematics, social studies, and science, unless the Freedom and Education Savings Account is allocated monies according to a transfer schedule other than the quarterly transfer pursuant to this section. So to use a portion of the funds to provide the student um, an education in at least those categories, the monies are only for qualified expenses. So I want to make sure that we're, we're clarifying that. Parents of eligible students must apply, and the department will accept applications between July 1st and June 30th of each year. Applications must be approved within 30 days. Education service providers, uh, private schools for example, may choose to notify the department of their desire to participate. No private school or institution is obligated to accept ESA funds. It is an opt-in for both education service providers as well as families. And that can be found on page 6, line 13 through 21. Nothing in this policy obligates any institution to accept these funds. Uh, we already went over the definitions. Um, so we def define qualified student and qualified school. That's in there. Qualified expenses are enumerated. The accounts will be, be managed by a private firm, for example, like Class Wallet or another vendor. Uh, the AG can investigate possible fraud at any time. Money goes direct, they're direct payments, so no one touches it. And students don't have to unenroll before applying for the program. The next section that I want to take you into is is on page six, uh, line ten, where we have state control over non-public schools. Now we've had a, I have been getting a lot of comments in regards to um, some of our our homeschooling families that are concerned with what's transpiring with homeschool. And I will tell you, this section in here, and we've had several attorneys look it over, actually strengthens homeschooling in our state. And I'm going to go through it. It's a very short section. And like I said, it's on page 6, line, line 10, 33-6604. State control over non-public schools. This chapter does not permit 
any government agency to exercise control or supervision over any non-public school or homeschooling. A qualified school that accepts a payment from a parent pursuant to this chapter is not an agent of the state or federal government. A qualified school shall not be required to alter its creed, practices, admissions, policy, or curriculum in order to accept students whose parents pay tuition or fees from a Freedom and Education Savings Account pursuant to this chapter in order to participate as a qualified school. Four, in any legal proceeding challenging the application of this chapter to a qualified school, the state bears the burden of establishing that the law is necessary and does not impose any undue burden on qualified schools. So we're actually strengthening, this section actually strengthens homeschooling and per, gives it a, um, a more substantive protection. I want to go down to the next section, then line 22 on page 6, which is the Parent Oversight Committee. And I think this is another really important factor in regards to this, uh, the savings account. Um, because we want parents involved. We want them, and parents know what's going on in their education system best. They, they see what's happening with their kids. They go to, they go to uh, meetings, and, and uh, you know, I go to, my kids are all in public school. We go to their parent-teacher conferences. So this is a great, great oversight that helps out. So um, with this section, uh, 336605, I wanted to read on lines 23, uh, the Parent Oversight Committee is hereby established consisting of six members who are parents of qualified students who receive Freedom and Education Savings Account monies under this chapter. And the members shall be appointed as follows. One, a member who is appointed by the Senate President Pro Tem, one member who is appointed by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, one member who is appointed by the Minority Leader of the Senate, one member who is appointed by the Minority Leader of the House of Representatives, and two members who are appointed by the governor. And at a, at a minimum, the members appointed shall be parents of qualified students. Uh, so because this is composed of parents of school choice students, it's important for parents to serve on the committee to have skin in the game. They cannot advise on how to improve the program or address concerns unless they have a child participating in it. A parent may not serve on the committee if any of the following apply. The parent is an employee of a relative of an employee of the department. The parent receives money or compensation or is associated with a lobbyist organization. A school choice advocacy group or a private financial management firm that manages the Freedom and Education Savings Account. The parent provides goods or services to qualified students that are purchased under the program. So those are the parents that cannot serve on the committee. But we do want parents who are involved to see what's going on and, like I said, have skin in the game to be part of that process. The committee shall have annual, shall annually elect a chairperson from among its members, and the committee shall meet at least once each calendar quarter. So that's a very important component, I believe, um, to be able to oversee this, this program. Do you want to talk about your homeschooling? On that part, yeah. I wanted Senator Lenny to talk just briefly in regards to the homeschooling, so I'm going to turn it back over to him for just a moment so he can share, share some insight um, in regards to that. Thank you, Senator Nichols. And just for the record again, Senator Brian Lenny, District 13, Nampa, Idaho. Um, as a, you know, I've been homeschooling, and when I say I, I mean my wife. Uh, we've been homeschooling our kids for uh, going on 11 years now. And, um, you know, we're, we're very blessed to be able to do that in Idaho, coming from a state where homeschool freedoms were, were, were very restricted. Um, so I just wanted to put this out there. You know, there has been a backlash um, from a lot of people in the Idaho homeschooling community saying that this bill would, would do something to change homeschool, uh, change homeschool or give the government more, um, you know, get their foot in the door with homeschools. If that was the case with this bill, I wouldn't be co-sponsoring it. I wouldn't be presenting it. I would actually be on that. I would be signed up to testify against it. So I just wanted to put that out there that... Um, this bill, as Senator Nichols said, does not only does it do 
it, it does no harm or it doesn't intrude into homeschooling. It actually provides additional protections um, that currently aren't in there. And, you know, as a homeschooler myself, um, I'm more concerned about the growth of what, what I view as a, a growing government monopoly um, in the public education system. Um, so I think this is a, a good way to decentralize that monopoly and return control back to the parents. Um, and like I said, again, if this did anything to alter or change homeschooling in Idaho, um, I, I would be actively fighting against it. So just wanted to throw that out there. And Senator Nichols, are you coming back up? Okay. Okay, again, Senator Tammy Nichols, District uh, 10. Uh, so I think um, I'd like to go ahead and start hearing the testimonies, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. I know we have a lot of people here that have testified, and then we'd be glad to answer questions uh, now or um, later on. But I know we have a lot of people that are here to, to testify, and we want to give them that opportunity. And then we're glad to come back up and answer questions. Thank you, Senator. I think we have questions from the committee. So we'll start with uh, Senator ward Ingle king Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator Nichols and Senator Lenny. Um, I have quite a few questions, but I, I'm just, I would like to just maybe talk about two of them. I'm very concerned about your fiscal note. Um, from what research I've done um, with the homeschoolers and private school um, students, there's about between 18 and 20,000. From what I see here, you're saying this amount would cover approximately 6,600 students. Um, so are you only going to open it up to the first 6,600? Or is, this, um, is that just the starting point? Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Senator Ward Ingleking. Um, so what we did, and going back to the pie chart, is we, we are um, asking, appropriating $45 million. Uh, we put 2% in there because we actually don't think it's going to be 2%. What we're seeing in other states right now is between 0.6 and 1%, but we wanted to make sure there was enough cushion in there just in case the program became that, is that popular. And if it becomes that popular, that means we have more of a problem than what we in initially thought we did. Um, and so we added the 2%, which is 6,600 students, to be able to use the program in the first year. Now, when that money is gone um, every year, we, they will come back to the legislature to talk about the program, talk about what kind of um, uh, participation they had in it, and if more money is needed to be allocated, then that's up to the legislative body to be able to do. Follow up, if I may. Senator. Thank you. Um, then, um, so I assume, though, that every person in a private school would be eligible and every homeschooler would be eligible for this. So if they're currently enrolled, in a private school and want to benefit from this money, they could, they would be eligible. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. So yes, currently, if they are in a private school, they could qualify for this program. Uh, if they are in public school right now, then, and they transition out of public school and they decide not to attend, then they could qualify for this program. But every child that we have in the state of Idaho, we have money allocated for them to be able to participate in public education, regardless if they're attending public school or not. If a, st a student goes from homeschooling or a private school into public school, we're going to fund them. Um, Mr. Chairman, one more question, then I will no, wait my fine. turn. Senator Engel King. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for indulging me. Um, and I, I just wondered, and I'm not sure who this should go to, but are you aware that homeschoolers can currently take classes, testing, or participate in extracurricular programs of their traditional public or charter school? Are you aware of that? Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator. Yes, we know that there are other programs that are available that um, students can participate in if they're not in the traditional public setting. Um, there is um, money that's available, um, but it's very, very limited in, in what um, is out there. Right now, there's the um, Empowering Parents program. I'm currently trying to participate in that program just to, to test it out, but it's only $1,000 per, per student with a maximum of 3000 per household. I've been waiting almost six weeks now to get on that program, um, and so I still don't have, have anything going with it right now. Um, just a clarification. Senator. Um, 
Homeschoolers do not have to pay. They can, you know, anybody who wants to participate in their a traditional public school, they can um, without any charge whatsoever. And I guess I'm wondering, how would the money then flow from this program back to the traditional school who's hired the coach, the music teacher, or whatever? How would that flow from this program? Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator. Um, I want to make sure I'm clear on what you're asking. So we have 80%, so we're talking to state dollars, 80% of that money goes with the student, 20% stays with the school. If for some reason the student doesn't qualify or ha what have you, then that money would go back to the state funds. Um, and so it would just, it, since no one actually touches the money besides the state, then that money would just transition. And yes, you're correct. There's there's programs available that would continue. That wouldn't change. We're not changing any of those. Um, just one. I guess I'm. I, maybe I'm not understanding because it says one of the services that's listed is services provided by that they would be able to participate in services provided by a public school, including individual classes and extracurricular programs. So I guess I'm wondering how these funds then would flow to the public school if, in fact, it's been given to the parents. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're meaning the mechanics then behind it. I just want to make sure that that's clear. And, and you can use funding from the program for classes and extracurricular activities at public schools under this bill. It would, just, it would be done through the digital platform that would be put together to be able to utilize those funds. Thank you. A clarification, Senator, did I hear you say that money is set aside in the state for all students, whether they attend public or private school? Mr. Chairman, uh, what I mean is if we have a student that is in uh, homeschooling or private school right now and they transition over to public school, they enroll, we're going to fund that student. We're not going to not let them attend public school. Okay. Senator Carlson. Chairman Lent and uh, Senator Nichols. Quick clarification question. Um, Senator Lenny stated on item 29, page 1, that this was available for K through 12. The bill says 1 through 12. Just, clarify, just getting a clarification on that. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Carlson, can you sh tell me where your Line 29. Okay. Is, it, is it for first grade or kindergarten? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator. So it's, it's specified, if you're looking at page 1, line 28, it's a kindergarten program or any grade 1 through 12. Oh, sorry, I missed no, that line. Good. Thank you. Senator Den Hartog. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Nichols, um, this is a mechanics question. Um, and I'm going to liken it to the existing program that we have with Empowering Parents. So through the digital platform, um, do we have the eligible expenses, so let's say someone wants to use their ESA for a tutor. Would that tutor then have an application process to be listed as a vendor on that platform? If you maybe could ex explain, not from the flip side, so I, I understand the parent side, if you could explain, and I'm calling it vendor, maybe there's a better word for the eligible expenses. I would appreciate an explanation of that. Thank you. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Den Hartog. Yes, you're correct. So both families and those that want to participate would have to fill out an application and opt in. So we're um, opening it up to whoever um, wants to do that. But it could be a tutor, it could be a school, it could be um, a, um, a, a class of some sort, a curriculum. But they would have to go ahead and, and fill out the application to be able to be a servicer. Follow-up, Senator? Yeah, and just a follow-up. Thank you for that explanation. Um, and this is, I know we're not supposed to ask a question we know the answer to, but I think this is important to for the audience to understand. So when that transaction takes place, all of that happens on the digital platform. So someone has to be an eligible provider is maybe the better word than vendor, and there's no other way for the money to be expended outside of that digital platform. Is that correct? Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator. Yes, so everything would go through the digital platform. That's correct. Senator Semeroff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Nichols. 
uh, for walking us through the bill. Um, private and religious schools can deny students for any reason. So a student with disabilities, dyslexia, English level, English language proficiency. Uh, what happens if a parent receives taxpayer money with the intent of using it for private tuition, but their student is denied um, from attending that private school? What happens to the taxpayer money and what happens to that student? Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Semmelroth. Um, so my understanding is that private institutions can't discriminate against students because um, if they have disabilities according to federal civil rights uh, laws and, and most likely other regulations, um, they may not be completely uh, able to service, but they can make um, uh, uh, they can they can do things to be able to get that that student to be able to attend. Um, so that's my understanding, and I I I could be wrong, but that is my understanding. But to your question, is that um, if the money is is not utilized by the student, then it goes back to the state funds. So any money that's not utilized would go back to the state funds, um, or if they don't qualify anymore, the student doesn't qualify. Follow up. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Nichols, um, I guess it's, it's still not clear to me how that money will make it back to taxpayers. Um, if a parent is receiving that taxpayer money and re-enrolls maybe the student mid-semester in a public school after being denied from a private school, um, because it is only public schools that are required to teach all children, private schools can, den can deny children uh, based on whatever reason. Um, so if if that parent re-enrolls that student mid-semester, does the money follow back to the public school? Will the parent have to repay the public school um, if that private school has denied that student? Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator. So again, the, the funds are allocated on a quarterly basis, so that way if there is a transition or something changes where the student doesn't qualify for whatever reason, there's only been a quarter each time that that money is actually put into the account. So it helps to um, keep from happening what you're just, just talking about. Um, and again, uh, you know, there, there's lots of options out there for education. So if one doesn't particularly work for a student, there might be some other options. And again, this is this will create innovation. We've seen that happening in, in many states that are, have put in some sort of an ESA or uh, education savings account where there's other options that are available um, for students. And so if one option doesn't work, there might be another one available that might be able to benefit them even more so. So, I mean, uh, you know, there's lots of hypotheticals that are out there, but the bottom line is that that, that money will go back to the state if it's not being utilized. It is only done on a quarterly basis, so if there is a change or transition, the families do sign an agreement, so they do have to abide by that agreement. Final follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Senator. S Senator Nichols, thank you for that explanation. When you say the money will go back, it is not clear to me in the bill who will at oversee that process and ensure that taxpayer dollars go back to that public school. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator. So the money is still in the possession of the state. So they're the ones that are allocating. The State Department of Education is the one that oversees it in conjunction with the treasurer. And then we also, again, have the attorney general for helping with um, any issues of fraud or anything like that. So the state still controls the funds. The families don't ever touch the money. So it's pretty easy to return it back to the state when the state already controls it. Senator Ward Engelking. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Senators. Um, thank you for your indulgence. I'm just trying to make sure I, I have the essence of this bill. And um, what, what I'm reading um, on page six is that we will be sending public money to private charter schools, homeschoolers. But um, just to be clear, there will be absolutely no oversight or accountability for this, there'll be no testing required. There'll be, um, it seems to say that um, a qualified school shall not be required, basically, to be have any accountability towards the state for these public funds. Am I reading that correctly? 
Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator. Um, would you direct me exactly, again, which, which section you're looking at? Page um, six? Yes, it says state control over non-public schools. And it says this chapter does not permit any government agency to exercise control or supervision over any non-public school or homeschooling. So that seems to me that that says there's no oversight, there's no accountability. Uh, required for the public funds that will be sent. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator. So again, um, yes, there are no testing requirements, um, and the accounts are audited, so there is control, there is oversight. Um, the accountability actually starts with the parents, and we believe that by giving the education funds back to the families that they will utilize those in a way that is going to benefit their students, um, not government bureaucrats. And so if a private school isn't providing a superior service, then why are the parents choosing them? So they're going to make sure that, and, and again, because this is a rollover account and this, the money can roll over as long as the student continues to qualify, when they graduate, they have that money available to them to use for post-secondary or for trade school or for, for other things that might benefit them as they transition out of um, uh, a K-12 through setting. So we believe that there is quite a few um, different benefits in here as far as accountability, but um, no, there is no testing requirements. And again, the section that you're referring to uh, strengthens those that are not in traditional education uh, settings. Senator Taves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Nichols. Um, I, I want to point out something that I think is sometimes lost in this conversation, that every student, every student in Idaho is eligible for public school funds. So I'd, I'd wonder if you would speak to the cost of this compared to the traditional public school system. Is this a good deal for the taxpayer for educating students? Because every student is eligible for public education. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator. Um, yes, so as you see on the on the graph there, we have the, the $3.5 billion, uh, which is um, which is our, our education pot uh, that we have. And again, we're asking for this, this little sliver of 45 million. What we're seeing happening, and Arizona is a great example, um, they had uh, different types of programs that they put together. They finally did do what's called universal, which is what this bill is. It's a universal education savings account. And what they're finding is for every two students, it's only costing them the amount of one in public school. So they're actually getting like a buy one, get one free, basically. Every two students, is only equal, equating to the cost of one public school student by doing an ESA program. Um, we are seeing also in education where the public schools, when programs like this are implemented, that the, the price per pupil actually ends up going up in those public schools, even though there might be student, because students have left, not a, a, and not so much that it's... Um, uh, shutting down our public schools at all, but um, they actually see a price per pupil increase because it's costing less for the students that are participating in these savings accounts. I do have a question. If we could go back to the other slide. Yes, yeah, so the way I interpret that slide is that's a piece of that pie that comes out and is dedicated to the issue that we're talking about. So, um, and I realize also that it provides for 20% to remain with the district. So um, as, as I've looked around the country at different places, it doesn't appear that those schools are closing down, that they're still open. And that is the assumption that 20% allows them to remain open? Senator thank, Nichols? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. So. Um, uh, going on to that regard, let me get to it and I can tell you exactly. Um, so first we have to ask ourselves this, you know, why would districts lose enrollment? Well, parents are looking for other options, right? Um, no school district in our state will ever lose more than 3% funding each year because that is in our Idaho law. 
And so Idaho provides funding protections for districts um, having significant enrollment declines. Uh, we saw some of that happening during COVID when families were pulling their students out of public education and, and utilizing other methods of education. So because of that, specifically in districts where the current year average, average daily attendance drops by 3% or more compared to the previous year, existing law enables funding to be based on the prior year's average daily attendance minus that 3%. So in other words, uh, declines in funding based on attendance are capped at that 3%. So, um, so we're not seeing that happening. Yes, we're, you're correct. We're not seeing schools shutting down because they have an enrollment taking place. Um, because in states like ours, 3% is the, the amount that has been set by law. So a follow-up, uh, Senator. Does that mean then that we're paying for ghost students who aren't there because of the 3% cap? Um, well, can you define what a ghost student is for me? So if the students have left, let's say you have 100 students, 10 of them, 20 of them leave, but yet you can only have a 3% reduction in your funding. Uh, more than that, 3% has left your district or left that school. So that has to be made up somehow. So we're essentially paying more money there for that school, for people who aren't there. Um, Mr. Chairman, so my response to that is, again, if we have students that leave traditional education public school, but then they come back, we're going to fund them either, we can fund them either way. So if they left the school, then that money is still there for them if they return. Okay, thank you. I think my concern is that we're funding two schools. That, that is my concern. Um, Senator Herndon. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Nichols, got a couple of technical questions. The first actually is not totally technical. We talk about qualified students on page one, <coughs> line 26, and I'm wondering how many students, how many qualified students are in the state of Idaho versus how many qualified students in the state of Idaho are currently enrolled in public or charter schools? Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think what we're estimating roughly right now is we have about um, 327, 328,000 total students in Idaho currently. And then all, all eligible ex only except 1% um, um, would, would, would take it up. So we're, we're looking at 1% of that amount, which is roughly around 3,300 students that we're looking at participating in this, in this program. Follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Follow-up, Senator Herndon. Senator Nichols, so of the 327,000, if I got the number right, but around there, are they all currently, are you including homeschoolers and private schoolers in that number? Senator Nichols. Um, yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, that we are including that in that number. Follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Senator. Okay, Senator Nichols, so then of those 327,000, I'm curious right now, how many are actually enrolled in public or charter schools, K through 12? Senator Nichols. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator. Um, we're anticipating, let me see, I think I have that down here. I don't have the exact number. I'm guessing approximately about 300,000 would be. And follow up, Mr. Chairman, different question. Senator. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Nichols. Uh, now I've got a couple of technical questions about the program. So on page one, line 37 through 40, we talk about the parent agreeing that they're going to educate their children and at least the subjects of reading, grammar, mathematics, social studies, and science. So that, of course, would mean that of the total available in their education savings account, they would have to include at least those subjects. So if they're including other subjects, which I would expect they would, for example, a foreign language, how do we keep track, how does the department keep track of the fact that they included at least these subjects versus other subjects. Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator. 
So um, I want to start off with, again, this is, this is a, an opt-in. So the, whoever is wanting to provide classes or language classes or anything like that, they have to notify the State Department of Education that they want to participate in that. So that's the first, first thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm, ass I'm assuming, um, and as stated in the bill, that the Department of Education can um, uh, allocate other rules and different things to be able to run and manage that program. And so they would probably keep a, a list of what type of, of um, if you want to call them vendors, uh, would be participating in, in that program as well. Um, and that, that might fluctuate. You might have some that don't, that start off and they, they do participate and then they don't want to anymore. Um, and so, uh, but, but I'm sure there's going to be some sort of a listing to be able to um, to be able to to see who who's who's participating, and then there, there's going to be audits that are going to be done as well to be able to take care of that. Um, if if parents violate the agreement, then that's consistent with it being fraud, and um, the audits are done to prevent that. But if we need to go further, then the AG can step in to to take care of that problem. Follow up, Senator. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Senator Nichols. Now on the total. Total funding appropriated, since I'm on JFAC, I'm interested in the total numbers. If we appropriate $45 million in the first year of the program and then more parents apply so that there are more students at the approximate amount that each student would receive, $5,950, what happens in that case? So in any given year, if we have not appropriated enough money for the program versus those who have applied, what happens? Senator Nichols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator Herndon. Um, so again, um, it would be on an annual basis. Uh, the State Department of Education would come before the legislature. Uh, when when the money is when the money is gone, then the people that may not be able to participate in that year would just reapply again for the next year. Um, but it, that's why we're doing it on an annual basis. It's a first come first serve uh, mentality uh, for the first year, and then the department will um, report the number of applicants each year, and so that will give the le legislature an idea of how popular the program is, how many numbers we're looking at per year, and uh, we'll appropriate funds um, based on the number of applications received. Senator Ward Ingle King. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, just to be clear, um, school districts are not uh, funded for all children that live in their district. They actually receive their funding uh, based on average daily attendance and enrollment. So they aren't receiving the funding for the homeschoolers or private school students. And, um, and I guess I'm still having trouble understanding if a parent were to homeschool their child, um, maybe they have four children and they're going to homeschool them, um, I would assume that, parent, that money is going to then flow to the parents because they're homeschooling them. It's not going to stay with the State Department of Education. Am, am I misunderstanding that? Senator Nichols. Okay. I'm going to turn that over to Senator Lenny, if that's OK, because he has firsthand experience with that and can answer that question better. Yeah, so on, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Ward Ingo King. Senator Brian Lenny, District 13, Nampa, for the record again. Um, on on the if I, I think I understand exactly what you're saying, so uh, if a homeschooling family with four children decides to opt into this program, um, that money. So we have, as Senator uh, Din Hartog pointed out, we have ES uh, educational service providers who apply to opt in. They they say I would like to participate in this program. So we have a list of whoever that is. Some schools will, some schools won't, whatever. Um, and then we have families who apply to opt in. So if they decide to do that, that money does not go. Here's how I think of it. Um, may, maybe an analogy will help. This helped, helped me understand it a long time ago. But similar, like if you go on like Amazon.com, you have the things you want to buy. You, you check out, you know, the, the money doesn't go, the, it all happens on the platform. So there's never a time where a, a parent uh, controls or owns the money. It's all, 
you log into the and and this all depends on how the state department of education will set it up as well but you log into the platform i want to hire this private tutor okay click um do again this depends on how the state department of education sets it up but there's no debit card the parents can't actually access the money physically so they would kind of Similar to Amazon, how you put something in checkout, I would like to opt into these private, you know, hire this private tutor for my kids. And then once that, transac once that transaction takes place on the website, then the state would then say, okay, private tutor, here's, here's your money that, was that the parent decided to spend. Does that answer your question or am I totally missing what you're saying? <laughs> Senator Ward Ingle King. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, partially, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how it would flow then back to the school district if, in fact, they were doing extracurricular activities, if they were taking a class, if they were, what, how would, uh, or would the, and if the parents want to do this all on their own at home, then would they be eligible as a vendor to receive that money? Senator so, Lenny. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Ward Engel King. So, they, I don't believe the parents would be able to just pay themselves for for homeschooling their child. I could be wrong in that, but I don't I don't believe because the, again, the State Department of Education has to approve vendors. It's not just like a free for all. They can't go on a Apple or Amazon.com like similar programs we have now. Um, but if say say you're homeschooling your child and you want to take like a drama class for instance at a public school it's the same process so first of all that the person uh running that drama class or they would have already had to opt in to that to say hey i want this drama class to be eligible to anyone who wants to take it so the parent would again like all the transactions happen within the platform if that makes sense Thank you, Senator. Uh, another question I had. It seems like the religious and private school population is an important number here because they certainly could contribute or participate right off the bat. Uh, what number are you using, again, just to verify for those potential private and religious school students who could participate? Well, I, I believe the number of students who are outside of the public school system right now, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question, is something of, so, somewhere around, I believe, 17,000 approximately. Um, so as far as the number of students, are, are you saying how many do we think are going to opt in year one? Um, it's just in the, we expect somewhere between 0.6 on the low end at the very high end, which from what I've seen, and I know you've studied this too, um, states who have implemented similar programs on the high end, it could be close to 2%, but we're expecting somewhere around 1% of total students to opt into this year one. It could be, could be less. I, I think it probably might be less year one. It could be more, but, you know, we haven't, we haven't done it yet, so it's hard to, hard to say. Thank you, Senator. Follow-up, uh, let's project out four or five years. What percentage of the population would you expect to be there then? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know. We haven't done it yet. So I, if, I, I wish I knew that number. Um, I would expect it to grow if, if it's a good, just like any program or any, any line item we have or any program. Um, I, I'm not a prophet, so I wish I could answer that one. But yeah. There is data on, on states that have done this. So the data is there. Examples. Well, yeah, I don't have it right. Sorry, I left my notes down there. Actually, Senator Nichols has that, if that's okay to yield. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Tammy Nichols, District 10. So in looking at other states across the nation that have done this, um, again, we're looking at 0.6 uh, to approximately 2%, but 1% is a very strong number for states that have implemented any kind of, uh, of ESA program, and not, not necessarily universal, but a strong ESA program. I would anticipate that we would be less than, four, projecting four or five years out, I would say we'd be less than 5%. Um, we have not seen um, states that have had their program in place uh, two, three, four years um, go above that. So, so that's, that's my projection. Thank you. I'd be interested in knowing the number of 5%, what that would cost the state. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, can I just sure. make a comment to that? So again, in states that we see do this, um, it is costing the state less money to be able to do a program such as this than it's costing them to um, 
fund a student in public education. So it, most of the states, most of the programs we see, they're able to, to actually um, pay for education for two children, what it would cost for one child in a public education setting. Senator uh, Simroth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is more of a procedural question. Will we be taking more questions as a committee at the end of testimony, or is this our time to ask questions? Uh, Senator, we can take further. I realize that our committee will vote on this eventually. So it's appropriate that we take time to try to understand it ourselves, as well as take testimony. So uh, it seems appropriate that we would take testimony and then before we take a final vote, we would have further discussion. I think Great. that would be appropriate. Thank you for that clarification. I see no further uh, questions. Would you like to finish up for us your portion today? Sure, yeah. Um, thank you again for allowing us to come before the committee and, and talk about this. Um, we know this is a very important issue for, for people, we, um, for families. We are seeing states all around us. I believe there's about 27 states that are um, looking at adopting or expanding their current ESA programs. Uh, and so we feel that, you know, Idaho should not be leaving our, our, our children in, in a situation where there's other educational opportunities for them. Uh, it's time to rethink and improve the way we fund education in Idaho. And universal ESAs uh, are a critical part of this process. Um, they're more, the most transformative way to give parents and students the resources that they need to succeed. And by giving families the ability to access educational options that would not have been available for their students otherwise, then a universal ESA actually improves educational outcome. I've had the opportunity to talk to students that have lived in inner cities where they were, they were stuck where they were, and, uh, and their areas uh, adopted a ESA program. And they, they testify about how, without that program, they would not have had the edu educational opportunities that they were able to um, participate in, that they would have been stuck uh, on the streets and in gangs, drugs, pregnancies, anything along those lines, but because they had a program in place that gave them more educational choice and more options, then it, it changed the trajectory of where their life was heading. Um, this is this is the prime time to be able to do this. We we have we are seeing parents asking for more opportunities, more more options to be able to educate their children. And again, like I said, um, competition is good. Competition is healthy, and we see that also take place um, where ESAs have been implemented. And we see again innovation. There's a lot of ways to be able to educate, and education is not a one size fits all approach. Um, this bill creates the framework for success, and we want our students to be successful. And so um, with that, I will close. We'll um, go ahead and allow the public testimony that, um, and we appreciate everyone that has come to, to give their uh, testimony, uh, either for or against it. Uh, it's a healthy dialogue to have, and we want to make sure that um, we, we hear all sorts of different, different options and, and um, perspectives. So thank you again, and um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Nichols and Senator Lenny. We invite you to join us back on the stand. Thing law to provide for education savings accounts. Um, we do not allow clapping, cheering, comments from the audience. We need to remain quiet. If and I realize sometimes that's hard to do, but uh, w I will ask you to leave if you can't maintain that. Uh, testimony will be taken on pro and con basis. Uh, those for and those against, we'll try to rotate that through. We're going to limit the testimony to two minutes, and we'll have a timer. You'll see the two minutes. Uh, if anyone has driven a significant distance today, I, I understand there's a couple who have driven many hours. Uh, let us know. Uh, raise your hand, and Hannah will try to contact you, and we'll see if we can't get you in today. I suspect we're going to be here at least for another hour, probably more but we'll get you uh, so that you can uh, uh, have an opportunity to testify today. Uh, our committee members will be have the opportunity to ask questions. We do not debate the issue with you as you come forward, but we may ask for clarifications. Um, and we may, uh, based on how long it takes us to get through here, it's likely that we will reconvene again tomorrow and continue our meeting. So with that, we'd like to begin. Uh, the process will be I will call out 
It's kind of like baseball, the three names who are up. If you would come up, and uh, we have reserved seats here, so we don't uh, waste time. You're just up next, and you just jump up and go. When you come up, identify your name and where you're from, uh, and we'll proceed on that manner. We have both in-person and video testimony today as well. So the first three are Laura Fisher, Anna Miller, and Rod Grammer. If they would come forward. In that order, Laura Fisher will be first. Rod Grammer, and after Rod is Elizabeth Noonan. So Elizabeth, if you'd come forward to the third seat. Please identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, uh, my name is Laura Fisher. I live in Boise County, and I am in favor of this bill. I've been a teacher since 1989. Over the last 33 years, I've taught every grade level from kindergarten to college in traditional, private, charter, and home schools. The best school I ever worked for was a charter school. The worst school I ever worked for was a charter school. Overall, I view charter schools favorably, and I'm delighted that Idaho has this form of education choice. But my message for you today is that charter schools are not enough. In my experience, the best form of education by far is homeschooling. In terms of efficiency, flexibility, character development, and emotional health of children, educating at home cannot be matched. I can think of no better investment of education funds than an ESA, which will allow more families to make homeschooling a real reality. Even the superior charter school at which I worked was hamstrung by grade level restrictions and lack of individualized instruction. And I walked away from the traditional classroom in 2016, determined that I was done with teaching forever. But the teaching bug within me would not be exterminated. And in 2018, I began my own small business teaching live online math courses to homeschooled sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students. Many of my students take a course that is below grade level, according to the traditional classroom-based system. They are experiencing success in math for the first time in years, and in some cases, in their lives. They are also loving a subject that they once hated. There are students who are well served by the traditional classroom based models, but for the sake of those students whose needs are not met by classroom based education, I am pleading with you to move this bill forward. Thank you. Uh, Anna Miller, if you would mind, uh, and so that we can alternate here, we'll, we're learning how to do this. so. Rod, I believe you're, uh, you're against the bill. So I'll try to alternate. Sorry about that, Anna. We'll, we'll try to alternate these back and forth. So uh, Rod, uh, Thank you, Grammer, Mr. we welcome you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, my name is Rod Grammer. I'm president of Idaho Business for Education, a group of more than 250 business leaders from across the state uh, working in education. I'm here today to testify against Senate Bill 1038. Much has been said and will be said during this hearing about the Education Savings Account Bill. I don't want to repeat all the testimony that will be given today. We know that this bill hurts funding for public education in two ways. One, it can take money away from schools at the local level. The other is it can put pressure on the state general fund. We also know that this bill, if passed, will violate the Idaho Constitution, Article 9, Section 5. But those are only two important reasons to oppose it. What is not often said about this bill is that it will eventually lead to higher property taxes here in Idaho. Because that is, uh, this bill is as much a tax bill as it is an education bill. We know this because that's the experience in other states. In Indiana, for example, the, Idaho Farm, the Indiana Farm Bureau has opposed this uh, type of legislation because it takes money away from rural schools, and it causes farmers to raise their own property taxes just to keep their schools operating. Property taxpayers in Idaho are farmers, Main Street businesses, and homeowners cannot afford to have their property taxes increased. So many families in Boise and Coeur d'Alene who have already voted to send their kids to private religious schools can use this legislation. 
Today, I urge you to vote in the interest of your constituents, especially those in rural communities who stand to benefit little or not at all from this, and support your, support your constituents. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grammer. Anna Miller, uh, and then Elizabeth Noonan, and then we have Carolyn Harrison video. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman, members of the committee. So I'm Anna Miller. I'm the director of the Center for American Education at Idaho Freedom Foundation. Um, I want to use my time today um, to speak to how the ESA established in Senate Bill 1038 would actually operate, because there seems to be some confusion on the committee regarding that. So this policy actually follows very high standards that have been tested in other states for about a decade in states like Arizona and Florida. The bill establishes what's known as an opt-in system for both education service providers and for families. So no education service provider, private school, family, or home school is obligated to participate. However, everyone does have the voluntary free choice to do so. Um, education service providers who wish to participate and accept an ESA or accept ESA funds, they will notify the department of that choice. Parents who wish to establish an ESA for their child or children will voluntarily apply and sign an agreement with the department to do all of the following. First, they must not enroll their child in a public district or charter school. Second, they must use a portion of the funds to provide their child an education in at least the areas of math, science, reading, grammar, or social studies. And third, they must use the monies in the ESA only for qualified expenses as enumerated in the bill on page two. After the agreement is signed, the department will establish an ESA account for the qualified student. A student is eligible to renew their account until they finish high school. Monies also stop accruing in the account when a student finishes high school. The department will accept applications between July 1st and June 30th of each year. Applications must be approved within 30 days. The administrative responsibilities of the State Department of Education are detailed on page five, and they include the approval of applications of qualified students, conducting or contracting for annual, quarterly, or random audits, and other things. The department may contract with a private firm to establish the digital platform to facilitate the ESA, and direct payments are made to education service providers. These are facilitated on the digital platform. Money is never given to parents in the form of a check, but is only spent through secured, monitored digital platform. The State Department of Education will make deposits of monies into the accounts. The treasurer may contract with a private management firm to do this. Deposits to accounts are made in quarterly installments. And I'm just finishing up. These mechanisms provide accountability, security, and transparency for taxpayers. They've been proven to work in other ESA programs across the country. So for these reasons, I urge you to support Senate Bill 1038, which will extend educational opportunity to every student in Idaho, which while following best practices available to us for transparency and accountability. Thank you, Ms. Thank Miller. Thank you. Mr. Elizabeth. Chairman? Yes. Can I ask a question, um, Ms. Miller? I would be happy to stand for questions, Mr. Chairman. Hang on just a second. Would you stand for a question? Mr. Chairman, yes. Senator Herndon. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the indulgence of just one. I'm always focused on performance of students, so I think you may be a person who would know what would this do to performance of students in the state of Idaho. Thank you, Senator Herndon. For Ms. Miller. Sorry. Thank you, Senator Herndon, for your, for your question, uh, Chairman, members of the committee. That's an excellent question. Um, so actually research on school choice programs from across the country shows that where school choice programs exist, um, academic achievement in public schools actually increases. Um, of the existing studies on this, all of them except for three, this is not cherry, cherry picking, of all the existing studies, there's 28 studies, on the effects of private school choice programs on public schools, they show a favorable effect all except for three. Two show a neutral effect, one shows a negative effect. So the research is far, far on the side of school choice programs having a positive effect on public schools. They show that you know, school choice is the rising tide that lifts all boats. Um, it not only do students who participate in school choice programs often have um, higher graduation rates from college, um, are more likely to have a higher income um, later in life, um, they're more likely to have higher levels of academic achievement, but it's also improving existing public schools. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, 
Next we have Elizabeth Noonan, Carolyn Harris, followed by Mary Ruck, who will be next. So those three. And it looks like the next two after this one are videos. So uh, Ms. Noonan. Chairman Lent and members of the committee, my name is Elizabeth Noonan. I am a Boise taxpayer, resident, and registered voter. I'm speaking today to urge you to vote no on SB 1038. I taught post-secondary career and technical education in Idaho for 29 years, 20 at Boise State, and finished my career at CWI. My daughter attended Boise Public Schools, graduated from BSU, and is employed in Idaho. I have a vested interest in Idaho's K-12 public school system. When I retired, I worked as a paraprofessional in a special education resource room in the Boise School District. The fourth, fifth, and sixth graders I worked with had a variety of learning challenges and needed extra support to learn. Their teachers were innovative in meeting the needs of these challenged students. The children were assessed on their goals regularly, and the teachers were accountable for their progress. Families were involved in their children's education. Strict standards were met by children and by teachers. I oppose SB 1038 because monies from our underfunded public schools that serve all children will be gutted to support this program eventually in coming years. Remarkably, there's no oversight or accountability for the actual education the students will get in their private, religious, and for-profit schools. How will we know what they are learning? Um, even though the state is paying for it, as a taxpayer and an educator, I'm appalled by this. I don't want to fund private education. I went through private education. My parents paid for it. There's also 529 Idaho Ideal Savings Plan, $6,000 tax benefit if parents use that. I urge you to vote no on SB 1038, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Or Ms. Noonan. <laughs> thank you. Oh. We're good. Okay. <laughs> Carolyn Harrison, Tom Harrison, We'll have you both go, and then Mary Ruck would be after that. All videos. So, Okay, my name is Carolyn Harrison. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, Chairman Lent, uh, members of the Senate Education Committee. I'm here today to wholeheartedly support Senate Bill 1038, um, the Freedom in Education Savings Account Bill. My goal today is to let people know about my husband, Tom, and my experience with both the public and the private school systems. We sent our daughter to a Christian school until she was in seventh grade, where she had just finished a book, book report on Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. She had memorized the periodic table of elements. She pledged flag to the, uh, the pledge of allegiance to the flag every day. And she thanked, thanked God every day for our wonderful country. When in seventh grade, she had transferred to a public school. She had to dummy down appreciably um, academically for six years and was introduced to a whole new kind of different and uncomfortable uh, social environment for her. So when she had children after knowing both sides of the coin, she knew she was never going to send her children to a public school. So she's now enrolling her three children in a Christian K through 12 school here in Idaho Falls, where her seven year old daughter is now pledging allegiance to the flag, thanking God for our country. And coincidentally, she's learning how to pass a bill in the legislature. So now our daughter's um, husband and she are experiencing the financial double dipping that Tom and I experienced when the parents are forced to pay for a private school cost as well as a public school system where their children do not have, participate. We are looking at how, how tough it is for, for um, a lot of these uh, educators, a lot of the people who are in these public school systems because there's an inordinate amount of time who's now, are now being spent on identity politics and social justice theories um, where the character, 
social care, you know, character tra uh, traits and the emotional regulation is by teachers, not professionals. The National Association or Assessment of Educational Progress scores are bad here in the state of Ms. Idaho. Harrison, your time's up. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. I, I assume I assume Tom is there with you. Yeah, Tom, do you want to come in? Let me get him. Good afternoon, Mr. Harrison. Chairman Lint, thank you very much, and I want to thank you and your fellow uh, Senate uh, Education Committee members for allowing me to uh, spend some time. Oh. Can he, Tom, if you can hear us, go back to your other computer. That's where he's at. He switched over. Yeah. Good call in. So we will get a hold of Tom and have him come back later. Uh, we'll move to Mary Ruck at this time. Heather Stout and uh, Norma Staff would be the next ones in, in order. I'm, I'm going to probably, because they're fairly mixed, the pros and cons, it's almost easier for us to follow that rather than jump around on here. So I'll just follow it down through. Uh, Mary will be next. Hi, uh, Chairman Lent. This is Mary Ruck, and I am, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. I am a Boise resident, and I am speaking in opposition to SB 1038. I am at my son's house right now, and his two absolutely wonderful grand, uh, his daughters, my granddaughters, one in second grade and one entering kindergarten next fall. They and the other 319,067 children in public schools around the state deserve a well-funded public school system. Please do not set up our public schools to fail by approving this ESA voucher system, which will end up bleeding the public schools dry of adequate funding. It won't happen the first year, but it will happen. And other states have shown that, their experiences. My granddaughters and the children of this state are counting on you, all of you. Please don't make them suffer the inexorable downgrading of their education that an ESA uh, voucher system would cause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. We'll now do go to Heather Stout, followed by Norma Staff and Jean Heinscheid. Gene Heinscheid is in person, so if you would come up to the front. Just sit right there and we'll get to you in just a second. Perfect. Hello. Hello, we're ready for you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Lent and committee members. Um, I don't know why you can't see me, but I'll do my testimony. My name is Heather Stout. I live on a farm ranch just north of Genesee, Idaho. Um, I'm here today to strongly urge you to vote no on um, Senate Bill 1038 um, because it will drain funding from public schools. My children attended Genesee School from elementary through high school. They are now U of I graduates. There is no other school, private or otherwise, in our area. 
If this bill goes forward, it will decimate small rural communities like mine. I do not want my public tax dollars funding private schools at all. In every state that has enacted ESA voucher programs, property taxes have increased. In Iowa, the cost is predicted to be $918 million in the first four years. Idaho doesn't need that. ESA programs have repeatedly been shown to negatively affect student achievement, especially in the areas of math and in reading proficiency. In addition, ESA programs have no accountability to the taxpayers, nor are they required to follow basic educational standards. That is definitely not how I want my tax dollars spent. I want my tax dollars going to public schools. With Idaho dead last in per pupil education spending, why? Why would we want to jeopardize our students or schools any further? Please protect our students and our, stu and our schools by voting no on Senate Bill 1038. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Staff. That was, uh, that was Heather Stout. Norma Staff is next. Ryan Spoon, if you're here, come up to the front as well. And Summer Brushnell. Hello, uh, my name is Norma Staff. I live in Idaho County in District 7. Uh, we are small forest owners. Idaho County children have already an abundance of school choice. They attend local public schools, online public charter schools, religious homeschools, homeschool networks, or a combination. This bill is not about choice. There is already plenty of choice. It is purely a money grab. It's a voucher, which are deeply unpopular in surveys with Idahoans. These are being promoted by out of state groups and will take money away from public schools. Idaho's constitution, which you all swore to uphold, requires that you fund public schools, not any other type of schools. This bill would also take away local control there's no oversight of what the curriculum would be. I would have no idea what is being taught down the street from my house. With public schools, if I don't like what's being taught, I can ask the principal to sit in on a class. I can meet with my locally elected school board, and I can bring this up. Recently, in Ohio, where I'm from originally, a homeschool network made the news for a history curriculum that teaches white supremacy, Nazism, honoring Hitler. Are you okay with that? I'm not okay with my tax dollars being used to promote hate. There is no oversight in this for what the curriculum would be, and there is no opportunity for me as a taxpayer to walk into someone's home and see what they're teaching. So vote no if you believe in Idaho's constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Staff. Jean Heinscheid, Henscheid is next. And then we'll have video Bessie Yaley, followed by Ryan Spoon. Chair Lent, co-chair Tays, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jean Henscheid. I'm a constituent of Senator Nichols from STAR. Over the seven generations my family has lived in Idaho, many, including me, have been public educators. I stand opposed to Senate Bill 1038. I see Senator Nichols' bill as the tale of two school systems. Metaphorically, let's think of these school systems as two houses. The house I own is crumbling, in need of more than $800 million in repair. Many of the children in this house need a safer environment. I've not purchased enough of the modern tools the children in this house will need to thrive in adulthood. 
I have not spent the money necessary to send the older children to workforce training or education beyond high school. Less than half have the certificate or degree they will need to successfully move out on their own. In the meantime, I've been thinking about the house next door. I'm intrigued with the idea that I could spend money on that house. I don't own the house, but have decided much of my money should go there. No strings attached. This house also seems in need of some repair. I've saved quite a bit of money, so if the homeowner decides to build an addition, I'll pay for that too. The many children in the house I own and many in the community are stunned by my decision. Committee members, my Idaho cares about every child. It is constitutionally obligated to spend its scarce resources on educating children in the public school system. I ask you to vote no on Senate Bill 1030, 1038 and attend to the children in the house you own. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hanscheid. Bessie Yaley is a video. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, you're good. We're good. Hello. We're good. Can you hear us? Yes. Hi, Chairman Lent and Committee. My name is Bessie Yuli. I'm testifying in opposition. Private schools do have the ability to de deny admission because they do not have to adhere to ADA laws. My son has been denied by Nampa Christian. Moving forward, it is my intention to speak so the disabled community are heard and represented. I am a disabled veteran, a mother of a disabled child, and a voter in District 10. This state does not adequately fund education. Idaho is the worst funded state in the United States. There is no guarantee of the passage of levies and bonds with people advocating against them. This bill would defund public education. This would defund special education programs. Currently, Idaho receives 30% of uh, federal funding for disabled students. School districts must front the other 70% of the cost for SPED programs. Removing funds from districts uh, removes funds from disabled kids. Private schools do not accept disabled students in their schools. They would have to adhere to ADA laws, which they have told me they don't want to do. Disabled kids would be forced to stay in underfunded schools with no other options. My son is severely disabled. He relies on his team of educators in his district. This defunding will drive out special educators who are already in short supply. If this bill turns out to be anything like Arizona's ESA that costs $200 million, based on Idaho popularity, this would equal the entire amount of funding the state of Idaho receives from ADA. My son's district, like many others, can't afford extra opportunities. I had a drive to donate use musical instru uh, instruments in Century Board to Face program because of lack of funding. In a nutshell, disabled students in SPED program are already struggling with a loss of staff in one-to-one -one supports, lack of access to resources because of lack of funding. Ms. Yaley, your, your time is up. Yes. Can I please finish, please? No access to other private, uh, to private schools. I think this is discriminating against a protected category of people. And public funds should never be used to discriminate. Section 504 of the ADA law states that disabled people... To be fair to everyone, yes. your time is up. So thank you for being here today. Will I be afforded the ability to bring a person into the meeting like another person was? Because I'd like to show you a child who would be affected by this. You're welcome, my disabled You're welcome son. to come to the meeting and testify. Our next presenter is Ryan Spoon, followed by Summer Bushnell and Sherry Hughes. Chairman Lent, Senators, thank you for having me today and thank you for your consideration of this bill. I am here to speak in favor of Senate Bill 1038. I didn't want to repeat what everyone else is already saying, so I thought to myself, who, which demographic is not being addressed in the testimony so far? The homeschoolers and the way that this uh, bill strengthens their protections has been addressed. We talked about the current public school, uh, school students and how this bill does not take money away from public schools. 
how it actually leaves additional money per pupil in public schools. And I couldn't really find a demographic that has not yet been addressed. And then it occurred to me, the only demographic that has not been addressed is you. You and your 70 colleagues in the legislature. How are you affected by this bill? As you're painfully aware, you deal with your daily lives with complaints and conflict from your constituents. And why is that? When have you heard people complain about the lack of choice in how they spend their unemployment check, or the lack of choice in how they spend food stamps, or lack of choice in how they uh, take a Pell Grant to NNU or uh, College of Idaho instead of BSU or U of I? There's no complaint or conflict there because those people have choice. That's all that we're asking here. And we want to reduce the complaints and conflict that you have to deal with by giving your constituents choice. If somebody doesn't like critical race theory or if somebody doesn't like who's in loud and which bathrooms, find another school. There are many to choose from. There will be more if this bill is passed. Just give your constituents choice. That's all we ask. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spoon. Uh, video now is Summer Bushnell, then Sherry Hughes, and Kayla Dodson. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. My name is Summer Bushnell. I am zooming in from Post Falls in Kootenai County, way up in North Idaho. I'm testifying in support of this bill. This is an opt-in program. There are no testing or curriculum guidelines from the Department of Education, and I like that. I have one child I'm currently homeschooling and one child who is in private school. I currently pay property taxes to the school district I live in, even though my children have never attended school in that school district. I love that this bill trusts me to know what is best for my children. I am a former teacher and a bit of a curriculum nerd, so I've been excited to see that I can choose the curriculum that is best for my homeschool child, not what the state of Idaho thinks is best. Is this a voucher? No, it's an education education savings account. Will this harm homeschooling? No. No money is actually going to a private school from what I've read in the bill. It's going to go to the parents. Accountability is with the parents and the financial auditing, not with the state of Idaho. And I really, really like that empowerment of me, the parent. And from what I have read, I do not think this bill violates the Blaine Amendment because the parent is giving the money to the people they think is appropriate. I also do not read where this bill raises taxes. In my biased opinion, if you oppose this bill, you don't trust parents to know what is best for their kids. If this bill makes a public school panic, then I would assume that they are already not being fiscally responsible with taxpayer money. And in regards to some of the comments made before me, I think it is wrong to say that a child would be harmed by this. I think those people are fear-mongering. Please pray and vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next you. Uh, presenter testifier is Sherry Hughes, then Kayla Dobson and Georgia Boatman. Good afternoon. Thank you, committee chair Lynn and committee members for an opportunity to remotely provide testimony on Senate Bill 1038. I am Sherry Hughes, lifelong Idaho native and current resident of Chalice, Idaho. I am speaking against this bill. My grandfather was instrumental as a Chalice Public School Board member in getting the original high school built here in Chalice. My mother served on the school board for 10 years, including during the Chalice earthquake and the rebuilding of the high school and the new middle school. I have grown up and been educated from first grade in Chalice through advanced degrees at Boise State University. I know the power and strength of consolidated public money for education, especially in rural Idaho. Based on Arizona's ESA voucher experience, the money proposed to be removed 
off the top of Idaho's education funding budget would take an estimated 17 to 20 percent of funding away from Chalice school districts in an area with no private alternative choices and where homeschooling students still access public school resources for proctoring, band, sports, special ed, and other extracurricular activities. The recent exodus of educators seeking better income in other states has had an enormous impact on the ability of rural schools to recruit and retain teachers. This bill only exacerbates that issue for places like Chalice. Fixed costs don't go away in rural schools, so the loss of 10 students only pulls money that's needed for teaching and supplies. Please don't gut our public schools and widen the divide in Idaho. Thank you for the ability to testify today. Thank you. Kayla Dobson. Dodson. Thank you, Chairman Lint and members of the Senate Education Committee. I'll move this down. Maybe I will. There. My name is Kayla Dodson, and I'm a resident of Idaho, and Boise specifically. I oppose Senate Bill 1038, and I will say I enjoyed a rewarding career as an educator, teacher from the grades 2 through 12, and as a school counselor. One main reason ESAs are a bad idea is the lack of accountability. For private schools, accreditation is optional, and they're not accountable to their locally elected school boards for teacher qualifications, certifications for curriculum, or student achievement. The ESAs would be available to any family interested in attending private schools or homeschooling. As it stands now, homeschool students is supposed to be comparably instructed as students in public schools. However, Idaho does not regulate or monitor homeschool instruction in any way. During my career, I was involved in pilot programs for implementing state standardized testing. And as a school counselor, I was responsible for organizing and overseeing the yearly state standardized testing for my school. Now, Student, non-public students are not required to participate in state standardized testing. Certainly, standardized testing is not the only metric that should be used to evaluate student progress, but it is one tool that students, parents, and educators can use to help guide student progress. Accountability is an important piece of our public education system. Giving public funds to private schools without accountability in these ways is not a conservative approach. I urge you to vote no on Senate Bill 1038. ESAs are not a good idea. I stand for questions. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you. Georgia Boatman in person, Rick Price video, and Kathy Dawes video. Chairman Lent, committee members, thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'm Georgia Boatman and I'm a taxpayer in Boise. I oppose SB 1038 because it provides funding for non-public education and yet does not provide for adequate educational accountability or fiscal accountability from those entities. We are a public education family. I care about the quality of education because I started as an Idaho public education teacher in Mountain Home and worked in public education for 43 years before retiring. My dad and my husband were Idaho public educators. Two of my three sons are Idaho public school educators in Meridian and Pocatello and most importantly my seven grandchildren are or will soon be students in the Idaho public education system. SB 1038 takes away from meager resources public schools currently have, yet has no expectation for private or homeschooling to have rigorous requirements for documenting and addressing student learning. They're not required to provide services for special needs students, whether they have a learning needs or are gifted and talented, or for addressing Idaho state standards. I want my grandchildren to have the advantage of a top quality public education, just as I had. Taking resources away from that system 
Resources that I paid my taxes for to provide for public education puts their education at risk. Similar ESA voucher systems in other states are prohibitively expensive, funneling money away from quality public education while showing no quantifiable benefit for student learning. I do not pay my taxes to watch my grandchildren's education be endangered. For these reasons and more, I urge you to vote no on SB 1038. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Ms. Boltman. Rick Price will be on video, Kathy Dawes, and Catherine Kula. Good afternoon, Senators, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. My name is Rick Price. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and thank you for your work in supporting education in Idaho. I am retired now, but spent 35 years of my teaching career in Idaho and have taught elementary grades in public schools in American Falls, in Victor, Idaho, and Teton County, and the last 20 plus years in Bonner County. I am testifying today because I believe our public schools as they exist now are the centers of our communities and we need to be working to support and strengthen them and this bill does not do that. The same people supporting ESAs now spent the last 30 years looking for accountability and ensuring the public has a good voice in how their schools are run. So I am asking for the same now. If my tax dollars are being sent to private schools, what assurance will I have that my money is producing results? Please show me how these students will be tested so we know whether they are learning or not. Please explain how we will know what the schools are actually teaching the kids sent to them. How, um, and how will the teachers be evaluated? What guidelines are overseeing the curriculum? Instead, this bill feels like a boondoggle that any responsible overseer of public money would afford. There are no sideboards. There is no oversight of either the buildings, the staff, or the curriculum. Public education is expensive partially because we provide the, all these things. We ensure our buildings have minimum safety standards. Our teachers are credentialed in the past background checks. Our curriculum is teaching the things we as a community and as a state think are important. But I need to repeat, testing. Senator Herndon talked about performance. This bill has no testing part to it at all. I did my best to teach every kid that showed up at my door, every teacher I worked with, and I will wrap it up there. Please oppose SB 1038. Thank you, Mr. Price. Thank you, and I stand for questions. Okay, thank you for participating today. Our next up is Kathy Dawes, Video. Followed by Catherine Kula on the telephone and Helen Hawley on video. Oh gosh. Uh oh. We're Hello? ready. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Chairman Lent and members of the committee. I'm Kathy Dawes, speaking on behalf of myself and my husband, Dana, in Moscow, in opposition to this bill. On the first day of this session, a presentation sponsored by Idaho Business for Education described what happened in Indiana after a program similar to this bill is proposing was instituted 11 years ago. Costs for the program rose from a starting point of 20 million, this program is starting at 45 million. It went up to nearly 300 million in 11 years. Sales taxes rose from six to 7% and communities have increasingly been asked to re-raise their property taxes through supplemental levies. We see this scenario in the largely rural state of Indiana as a strong possibility in Idaho if Bill S-1038 is passed. 
This bill requires general funds, the same source used it to fund public schools already underfunded. Future costs will go up along with our property taxes. Over one third, 36% of our own property tax bill pays our school levy and bond. For 50 years, we enlisted volunteers to wave and stand on strategic street corners on levy election day, wearing sandwich boards saying support our schools to support our school levies and bonds, which pay on average 45%, nearly half of our district's budget. Moscow High School is 84 years old without adequate teaching spaces, but there is no chance of passing a facilities bond anytime in the near future. Bill S-1038 is passed and our property taxes go up even more because the legislature chooses to use funds for ESAs should instead be used to meet its constitutional obligation to fund our public schools, we cannot and will not support future levies and bonds in our community. Please vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dawes. We're going to do a audible. We're in the football season or just getting over. So um, we're going to try back for Tom Harrison and then followed by Catherine Kula. So Tom Harrison on video. We have you. Chairman know. Lent? Yes. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Great. Uh, I'm sorry for the confusion. We've got two offices here. I wanted to thank you and your uh, fellow education committee members for allowing me to testify here today. Uh, as I said, my name is Tom Harrison. My address is 364 Stillwater Circle, Idaho Falls, Idaho. I'm here today to unreservedly support SB 1038, the Freedom in Education Savings Accounts Universal uh, ESA bill. My wife and I are business people. Uh, we currently have two companies based here in Idaho. My wife and I know how the US free enterprise system works. We passionately support the success of an economic system in which private businesses operate in a competitive environment and is largely free from state and federal regulation. We support the Freedom and Education Savings Account Parent Choice uh, Bill for economic reasons. Knowing that 82% of Idaho parents want education choice opportunities, Idaho is ready for a market-driven, competition-oriented education strategy that works for all. Senate Bill 1038 does just that. It focuses on the money following the kids, where individual choices are made by the parents for a child's specific educational needs. If parents are free to make a decision on their child's distinct educational needs, it will allow public schools to finally get the opportunity to, gain, to engage in competition, a driving force of the United States free market system, which was which is shown in education choice legislation in uh, previous states to result in greater efficiency and higher academic standards and achievement for public schools. Phenomenal positive results can develop from this win-win opportunity. And we encourage you to look at a new approach, an approach where an existing government-dominated education structure can be a part of that was always consistently worked well in the United States, a free enterprise, competition-oriented market system. Chairman Lent, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Senate Bill 1038, a win-win proposition for our kids. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. We now have Catherine Kula, followed by Helen Holly and Shane Schultes. Senator Lynn, may, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, Senator Lynn and committee members, this is Catherine Kula. I live in Idaho Falls, District 32. I'm speaking today in support of SB 1038. This country was founded on the capitalistic system. You have a good product, you succeed. A bad one, and you either improve it or go out of business. I keep hearing uh, those against this bill talking about accountability. 
Well, right now, the accountability of the public schools has a failing product. Test scores are down, math and reading aptitude are down, and basic morality is not even being taught. Parents are stretched to the max paying taxes and dealing with inflation. It's time that they keep some of their money and use it as they see fit to educate their children in the manner they choose. Right now, only the rich are able to have that choice. I attended private school when I was young and I transferred to public school mid-year. The teacher told my mom that she could have kept me home the rest of the year, but I, for I was so far ahead. So there's your accountability for what the private schools can do. I ask that you support this bill and give parents a choice. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. On video, Helen Holly, followed by Shane and then Karen Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Helen Hawley. I'm a retired public school teacher from North Carolina, and I've lived in Lewiston, Idaho for the past seven years. In that time, I've become quite active in my community and state, and I've had the opportunity to hear from many neighbors, educators, and others about the issues Idahoans care most about, our children. Today, I'm asking you to vote no on SB 1038, which seeks to provide education savings account funding. Providing funding for ESAs pulls vital funding from the whole in order to benefit the few. Pulling resources from public schools not only takes away from the programs vital to special needs students, but also takes money needed to provide paraprofessionals essential for optimal student learning. Pulling resources from public schools takes from the money Idaho needs to invest in attracting and retaining an adequate workforce of qualified teachers. Our public schools are already horribly understaffed. We can't afford to fail providing every school with the best and most staffing available to our children's needs. Public schools work because of public oversight through school board elections, meetings, PTAs, and public input. Our job, your job, is to ensure that all Idahoans get the best public education possible in a diverse, safe, functioning environment from well-qualified caring professionals and paraprofessionals. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next is Shane Schultes from Rexburg. Thank you. Uh, can you nod your head if you can hear me? Thank yes. you. My name is Shane Schulteis. I have about 24 years of experience teaching uh, both university as well as secondary education. I'm currently employed as an online teacher at a, uh, a, at a charter school. Uh, i just like to pose one question. Is the purpose of the state of Idaho's public funding of education to support a particular system of education, or is it to support every child's education in the state of Idaho? As a father of 10 children, I have had my children in home schools, private schools, charter schools, and public schools. I was very pleased with the education in each case because I was able to match the educational system to my needs of my child, as well as to the particular circumstances of our family. In two of those cases, however, I had to fund both the public system as well as a private system. 
I would just like to argue that if you were really looking to support every child in the state of Idaho, school choice is necessary for that to occur. I work at a school that requires six years of social studies in high school instead of the standard three. They read out of the Federalist Papers and Anti-Federalist Papers. It's very academically rigorous. Not every child will want that. By the way, we provide those students uh, that education to students with IEPs and 504s like any other public charter would. But not, it doesn't match every single parent or every single family. So I think that if you want to really help every student, you've got to move to a system that allows choice, and this bill does that. Finally, two things. Can it meet the rural needs of Af Idahoans? The answer is yes. This morning, I had a very interactive and robust conversation on international trade and the balance of payments with students from all over and was all online, very interactive. And finally, my last uh, uh, point is there is accountability. Uh, the, the school I work for right now has 3,000 students and 3,000 students on a wait list. The market does provide accountability. If you want to provide that service, we had to provide a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now have Karen Hansen, then Mark and Cloris Mullins and Brody Brostum. So, Karen Hansen. Hello. Start my video. Good grief. Okay. Hi, I assume you can hear me. I'm Karen Hansen from Viola, Idaho. And um, I don't know where to begin for sure. I feel very strongly that the ESA bill is a very bad bill, especially with the timing such as it is when we're struggling so hard to f adequately fund our public schools. Um, as a taxpayer, I, I, I just strenuously object to having my money go to entities that have no accountability and uh, where the opportunities for uh, misspending the money are so enormous. Um, good public schools have been the backbone of Idaho and of our nation as far as supporting a civil society and a strong economic uh, system and a strong democracy. Um, I don't have children. I don't care. I value that my tax dollars are spent on public education because it is a very critical public good. It doesn't matter that I don't have children of my own. I care very much about Idaho and this country. When you have a problem with the public school system, you don't defund it, and it's already half starved, and this bill is going to further defund public schools, which right now are desperate for enough money to do the job they need to do properly. And I just do not want this blank check written by the taxpayer to go to unaccountable entities. Some of the things that have been said in support of this bill are exactly the reasons I don't care for it. Uh, the ESA description is different from vouchers, actually makes it sound worse in terms of this, the, the unclarity of where the money goes. I'll stop now, but Thank you. this bill Thank you. is a problem. Thank you. Uh, we have up next Mark and I... I have a typo there, so I can't see that. Cloris Mullins on the telephone. Uh, after that, let's have Jason Richardson and Matthew Carden come up. If you're here and you have to travel, come up in the front here and we'll get you out uh, after this telephone one. Uh, hello, this is Cloris Mullins. Yes. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, my husband and I currently live in Parma, and we are the parents of six children and 20 grandchildren. Most of them also live in Idaho. 
and a lot of great things have been said, but we just wanted to voice our support to Senate Bill 1038 and appreciate uh, the opportunity to do that. I'm a retired teacher, have taught in different teaching settings, and within my own family, uh, I just see the need for a variety of opportunities for parents to teach in a variety of ways and appreciate what this bill would offer to our families as well as all Idaho families. Hi, I'll, I'll just jump in here. <clears throat> Mark Mullins, uh, <clears throat> I, I think that we're, we're having this discussion today because there's a need. And I, I believe that the, that the need uh, can be better met with, with giving more opportunity to parents to decide uh, what, what will work in their situation and their circumstances uh, better. Uh, the, the, the power belongs to the, the parents. They're, they're the ones ultimately responsible. For, for their their children and so I, I would urge support of this this bill I, I we've lived in other states and seen other things and are, are certainly in, in support of this uh, this kind of thing thank you very much for this opportunity thank you to the committee my name is Jason Richardson I'm from Rigby I've been an Idaho educator for 20 years I've taught in public school charter school private school and now a micro school I have certifications to teach Spanish, social studies, political science, economics, and mathematics. Um, I'm also the proud father of five former Senate pages. Cheyenne was a page for the full term last year, and I appreciate the care that you guys take uh, in taking care of them while they're here. Uh, seven, days, seven days ago, I was with my class of high school students exploring the Vatican in Rome. We actually went into the Santa Maria um, in Cosmedine, the church that's attached to the mouth of truth, uh, and saw the relics of St. Valentine. We got home on Saturday after 20 days in three European countries. My students get to study English, literature, math, science, economics, history, and quite a bit of the Harvard classics as our regular curriculum. And then we get to go and experience the things that we study. It's not a school that fits everybody's interests or skills, but it's an incredible opportunity for those that are fortunate enough to participate. This type of education is unmatched in traditional school. These kids spend their summers and spud harvest earning money for the trips, but they're only allowed to able to participate because of a very generous family that temporarily sponsors the payroll facilities, that's the stuff that uh, tuition would pay for. This new bill would allow us to continue and even to include more students. In my experience, parents are much more demanding of my teaching than the public school has been. Former non-traditional students of mine have gone to Idaho State Schools, UC Med programs, the military academies, and a diverse set of other educational programs. I can only imagine what great opportunities and education will be available when funding opens up and allows other dedicated families and professionals to work outside the traditional system. As I served the eight years as the mayor of Rigby, I often had to make decisions on how to change city operations to better serve my constituency. And I am grateful that you are looking at doing the same thing in education. Your I'm excited to see this bill there. pass, as it will allow families more personal choice on how their children are educated and how dynamic new education models can be in Idaho. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Lent, committee members, my name is Matt Carden from Idaho Falls. I'm a small business owner and I'm in favor of this bill. My wife and I opened a private school, a Montessori school, in 2001 and worked hard to make a difference in the lives of children from pre-K to high school for five years. From 2012 to 2020, I served on the board <clears throat> of a charter school. For three of those years, I was chairman of the board for that charter school. In 2020, we opened, this micro, we opened a micro school called Deseret Study Abroad Academy. We have middle school and high school classes. We provide an amazing opportunity for children to experience education in a unique and challenging environment. Our students study all the subjects, but our high school history curriculum is very unique. <clears throat> we study a time period and the history of the area of the world that it relates. Then, once or twice a year, the students have the opportunity to travel to that country and see what they have studied firsthand. Oftentimes, service opportunities are available, and the students are immersed in the culture and make friends with those they serve. 
They are blessed to live in this country. This model of education is an opportunity that expand their, expanded to other families that are already asking how they can be a part of this type of education. This bill would provide uh, necessary tuition dollars to help fund these, uh, to pay for the teachers and the facilities to help these families. Not for travel expenses, but just the opportunity to enroll. These students work hard to earn money for their own travel expenses. They just returned from a trip to France where they had the blessings to visit Normandy and see what American soldiers did under insurmountable odds and the sacred cemetery grounds where the fallen are buried. I encourage you to advance this bill and give the families the freedom to choose and expand the education that will truly enrich their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cardin. Judy Brostrom, Sylvia Adams, Lindsay Barber. Jody Brostrom is next. Video. Thank you, Chairman Lentz and committee for hearing my testimony today. I'm Jody Brostrom and I live in Lemhi County, town of Salmon. I'm opposed to Senate Bill 1038. Salmon has a not-for-profit, 18-bed critical access hospital and a level four trauma center. It serves the residents of Lemhi and Custer counties as well as those passing through our part of the state. It employs over 250 people who, along with their families, are an integral part of our community. Its importance to me struck a chord when in 2017 I suffered a heart attack, and after receiving tests and getting stabilized at the hospital, I was life flighted 160 miles to Missoula, Montana, the nearest hospital capable of treating critical patients. Recruiting talented healthcare professionals to rural communities is challenging, and Salmon is no exception. Candidates with families look at our school districts and are dismayed at the lack of meaningful investment by the state into public education, the inability to pass school bonds because of the supermajority requirement, the condition of the buildings, the list goes on. Most with kids pass on job offers. Our teachers do the best that they have with what they have, but there is a breaking point. Allocating public funds to private schools would make it even more difficult to bring professionals into our rural communities and for our students to become adults who want to stay here. Our community would suffer immeasurably if our health facilities closed due to lack of personnel. I may not be here now had it not been for our hospital to diagnose my condition and move me to a facility that could treat me. Over one third of Lemhi County residents are 65 years and older and rely on local health care to continue to thrive and contribute. So do the over 10% of our residents who are veterans. Do not take that away from them. Jody, your, Younger time, generations. your time is up, Jody. Thank you. Thank you for testifying. Sylvia Adams on the telephone. <clears throat> Waiting for Sylvia Adams, followed by Lindsay Barber and Larry Stevenson. While we're waiting, committee, um, it looks like we have a guess of about 60 more to go. Um, my suggestion would be we pick a time so that everybody knows kind of what our time frame is and uh, then resume tomorrow. Um, 
the challenge is, it's my understanding that that does erase the current slate of people who are scheduled for today, which is kind of a problem. So, um, is what's, what time is reasonable for our committee today? Uh, the, the chair would take some suggestions. Senator Carlson. Can we recess for five minutes? Sure. Um, let's, let's do, take a recess uh, for about, let's come back at 5.30 with a plan that we will go till 6 tonight at least. Um, Valentine's Day. <laughs> we love education. We love education. There you go. Uh, I, I think with the number of people, we should try to go till 6. If you need to be excused, certainly, uh, Senator, that would be appropriate. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll come back at 5.30 and resume uh, with Lindsey Barber, Larry Stevenson, Mary McAleese. Five-minute break. Looks like Senator Ward Engel King had a better offer. <laughs> Could I just see by a show of hands how many of you are here today that possibly would not be here tomorrow? A couple of you? Okay. Hannah, would you get their names so that we can well do you today? Our plan is to, we're going to shorten the time to one minute. We still have over 60 on the list. So if you'd consider uh, not repeating anything that's been said already, uh, make your point. We'll keep it to about a minute. Um, it will go till about 6 o'clock tonight, and then we'll resume tomorrow at 3. As soon as our agenda is posted again, the challenge is if you're on, on the list for today and you don't get done, you fall off the list and you have to re-up on the list on a new agenda. So that's part of the technology we have to deal with. So if there's someone who that won't work for, we need to, you need to let us know now so that we can get you in. Um, okay. So let's start down the list. Uh, we're going to go with one minute. And we're at Sylvia Adams, if you are on the telephone. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is Sylvia. You have one minute. Pardon? We're ready for you now. Thank you. Just one moment here. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Um, and if you feel there has been a preponderance of testimony this afternoon against SB 1038, this is not surprising given the fact that there has been a huge push by an organization here in Idaho, Reclaim Idaho, who is in league with the teachers union and therefore opposed to ESAs and school choice. I work my way through college. I hold a degree in education. I worked on staff at LA Technical and Trade College at Locke High School in Watts at East Los Angeles College, and in the LA City Schools Administrative Office. I come from a family of educators, including an aunt, two sisters, and their husbands, and several nieces. My husband, Gary, and I worked in humanitarian occupations Sylvia, for many years. Sylvia, we, we're yes. running short on time. If you would make your points, please. Okay. Okay, Grace. A great personal sacrifice, we opted to provide the best educational opportunities for our kids when the public schools failed us. We tried uh, many different types of schools, including large metropolitan, small town, and rural public, and a border town bilingual school through an educated, uh, accelerated education program 
private schools and as part of a cooperative and then homeschooling. Our school choices met the needs of our kids, and we then paid out of pocket over quite a number of years to assure our kids had the best educational opportunities possible. Uh, ESAs absolutely do not steal from public school funding. The public schools still retain 20% of each student's allocation, and they have they don't have the expense of educating that student. This is an often published claim by Reclaim Idaho. It is false. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, we've pretty much done it all, and we felt like the options where we had school choice were best for our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. We appreciate that. Lindsay, thank you. Lindsay. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. My phone wouldn't let me uh, opt in before. Okay. Lindsay Barber, Larry Stevenson, and Mary McAleese. Lindsay Barber. Thank you, Chairman Lynn. Um, my name is Lindsay Barber, and I'm in Post Falls, Idaho, and I'm here to voice my opposition to Senate Bill 1038. Our public schools are hurting, and here in Post Falls, where my three kids go to public school, we're struggling to retain teachers, we are struggling to recruit support staff, and it's really hard to pass that levy every two years. And the levy pays for really important things that the state should already be funding. Um, when that doesn't pass, our resources run very thin. And then Idaho's already last in the nation in per pupil spending. So um, our public schools aren't failing us. We are failing them. Um, also, data from states like Wisconsin have shown a significant increase to property taxes as a result of a similar ESA program. And our property taxes have already increased to the point of driving lifelong Idahoans from their homes. Like my mother is a lifelong Idahoan. She just retired and she could barely afford to pay her property taxes last year. And in a state where we're already struggling with the rising cost of homeownership and underfunding our public schools, this bill would have serious repercussions for even the people who support it. So please vote against ESA. But it built 1038. Thank, Thank you. you. That was really hard in one minute. <laughs> Thank you. You did an excellent job there. Uh, Larry Stevenson. Mary McAleese and S Scott Tate are next. You have one minute. Can you hear me? Yes, you have one minute, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Mr. Chair, can I distinguish my time today and get a full two minutes tomorrow? You know, we haven't crossed that bridge yet to what we're going to do tomorrow. Uh, but you're welcome to <laughs> you're welcome to come back tomorrow okay, and let see. Me, well, let, let, I got this on. I've been starting trying to get on the meeting since 3 p.m. this afternoon after pre-registering a week ago. But anyway, I've been a substitute teacher. I'm a retired businessman, so I'm a capitalist. And I think all the, the testimony we hear about pros and cons, there's gonna be pros and cons to anything. But anytime we can have a choice in our society for the taxpayers, I think this is a win for everybody. Uh, you know, being a businessman retired, I, I think it's important to create some kind of motivation incentive for schools, public schools especially, to improve their academics. Uh, when I was a substitute teacher, I saw a lot of students disconnected, didn't understand why they were being taught this, and we, I tried to mentor to them, and, and the older teachers would do that. The young teachers, not so much. So that being said, I, I don't like to see government make winners and losers. I think everybody would win with this, if we do approve uh, Senate Bill 1038. Thank, thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Appreciate your thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. I, I would take questions. Uh, we, we don't have any for you, so you must have done a good job. Thank you. Thank you, Mary McAleese.
Mary, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Great, thank you. My husband and I are both retired educators here in Pocatello. Um, we have a combined 57 years of teaching experience, so we feel pretty well qualified to comment on public education. I'd like to say I've always been a proponent of school choice and believe that parents usually know where their children will thrive. I'm also not opposed to public charter or public magnet schools. I believe that the more opportunities students have, the more invested they'll be in their own education and the more successful they'll be in their academic endeavors. However, I deeply believe that those opportunities should be available in a sound and fully funded public education system, a system which attracts the best and brightest to our profession and rewards excellence in all endeavors. We're currently in a crisis in the teaching profession and rural schools especially have a difficult time attracting and retaining high caliber teachers. Our investment needs to be in strengthening our public education systems, attracting innovative teachers who can excite students and individualize and tailor instruction, fund programs which contribute to the future of Idaho, such as strong vocational technical programs and rigorous programs in math and science. Thanks, Mary. This requires a major financial investment. Thank you. Senate Bill 38 will take funds away, and I adamantly oppose it. Thank you, thank Mary. You. We, we appreciate you waiting that long today to be on, so thank you very much. I, one minute. Oh, sign me up for that $3 million um, uh, administrative thing. Where's the job application? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Tate? I believe the proper salutation is good evening now, um, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, my name is Scott Tate. I went to McCall Elementary School, East Junior High, and Boise High School here in Boise. I graduated in 1975. That education uh, prepared me to go to a rather elite college in Los Angeles and then to go to the University of California. Hastings College of Law. I practiced law in, in San Francisco for 40 years. I lived in Oakland, uh, a site of white flight from the public schools. Uh, I, was, I had some prepared statement or comments, but I agree with Ms. Stout, Ms. Yaley, and Ms. Dodson, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. What I was stunned with uh, was the lack of responses to Senator Ward Engelking's questions here today. The, uh, my law firm in San Francisco paid almost $2 million for our IT department for a single law firm. I don't know how you could do all of this management for the number $2 million that's on the screen. Uh, random audits don't work. You need educated audits. The reason random audits don't work, people don't pay their taxes because of random audits. The, the uh, issues with the mechanism for working this program seem vacuous Thank to me. You. Uh, Could you just wrap up? Yeah. I'm opposed to this because it will hurt STEM programs and it will hurt VOTEC programs. I'd like to speak more, but thank you very much for your thank, attention. Thank you for waiting and being here. Sylvia Carlton, Garrett Castle, and Bonnie. Bonnie. Sylvia is up. Okay. I will start midstream. I'm a substitute teacher serving in the trenches again, has renewed my consternation about Idaho's overcrowded schools and inadequate facilities. Because legislators have a serious fiduciary responsibility to maintain our schools, I suggest you take a twi quick tour of your district schools and count the portable classrooms doting their landscape. The proliferation of pl portables indicates overcrowding and the lack of funding for adequate buildings. Idaho has always had public school infrastructure problems. During my career, I was in a bunch of places. Regardless of where I have been, Idaho school infrastructure problems are a perennial challenge. Most teachers have at least one dismal story to support. My most recent dis dismal story was last December during a very stormy and cold period when I had the displeasure of being assigned twice to drafty portables that lacked bathroom facilities. Idaho school infrastructure, building infrastructure problems are ubiquitous. I encourage teachers all over the state to send this committee their personal dismal stories so that it reinforces legislators fiduciary responsibilities and makes them rethink this bill's wrong-headed notion. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you. 
Garrett Castle. Chairman Lent and members of the committee, my name is Garrett Castle. My fiance is a fourth grade teacher. Part of our story is the struggle against underfunding education in Idaho. Four years ago, she came to me with tears in her eyes. Her public school was underfunded. They were facing either layoffs or she and other teachers could go to part time, no benefits. You can't fail your way into success here because the most giving people in Idaho break the choice argument. We will go down with that ship if you misallocate. You have created a lean ship in all of your districts, so lean that they will try and try and try until they break. Our argument is that we will serve the least among us. This bill takes from those who have the least choice in a dichotomous effort to give to those who have the most. We're those who support the least. Thank you. Thank you. Bonnie Kraft. Bonnie Schuster. She had to leave. I'm her husband. I oh. can come back tomorrow or I can try to shorten her statement. I think you're fine if you want to do hers right now. Okay, I got it written. Okay. Anyway, my name is Frank Martinez. I live in Boise. My wife is Bonnie Schuster. Uh, my wife and I chose to send our son to a private school. That was our choice. There's been a lot of emphasis on choice today. We chose to do that. We firmly believe in the public schools. We feel they should be funded, but we made that choice and we feel that we're totally against this bill because the money should go to the public schools that benefit the, the majority of the people in the state. So I shortened her statement. It was much more eloquent and she's a much better speaker, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Roberta Diamico. Diam okay. Uh, Melanie Edwards, John Rader, anyone here? Okay, so uh, Melanie Edwards virtual. Unmute. Uh, stop my video and mute. You're Can good. you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good afternoon, Chairman Lenton Committee. Um, I strongly agree with that last speaker. Um, I'm not against private schools, but I'm against public money going to those pub that going to those private schools. Um, I live in Bonneville County. It's Melanie Edwards. Um, I've been here 23 years, and although we don't have children, this is a very important issue to me. I'm opposed to to robbing our neighborhood public schools of taxpayer money. This money is necessary to keep our public schools functioning as they are mandated to do. Our public schools have fixed costs, so gutting their funding would drive up local property taxes to provide for their essential needs, which are already at bare bones level, as we've heard. The other states that have implemented a similar program have seen very large increases in property taxes. Our property taxes are already sky high and have increased by 35% this year for us. Like many, in um, others in Bonneville County, my husband and I are retired on fixed incomes, and if this scheme is passed, the impact will be to put us and others in our community at even more risk of being forced out of our homes by the extra demands on local taxpayers to properly fund our public schools. Even now, supplemental levies have not passed in our school district. I strongly urge you, as an education committee responsible for adequately funding public education, to vote against this damaging ESC voucher program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Melanie. John Reader, Virtual and Cottonwood. Reader. Chairman Lenton, Senate Committee, thanks for letting me join you. I'm John Rader. I'm the current superintendent of the Cottonwood School District in Cottonwood, Idaho. I had the fortunate opportunity in the past 19 years to be an educator in West Ada, Caldwell, and now in Cottonwood. Public schools are accountable for all students when it comes to state testing, attendance, discipline. We have testing requirements that the state requires for data and funding purposes, IRI and ISATs. We have to provide an education for every child that walks through the door, whether they are general education student with high academic success, 
di discipline and attendance issues, negative home life, and special education students. There are private schools and homeschoolers are able to teach whatever they choose with no accountability. Private schools are able to pick and choose which students they accept and which students they deny. I had an opportunity this fall where we had a student that attended a private school in our community. That student lasted three weeks and I was contacted by the administrator that we either needed to take that special educa education student or they're gonna lose their teacher. We had to take that kid. He's still here with a one-on-one -on -one aid and we are working with that child for success in the public school system. Thank you. I'm opposed to yeah, Senate ahead. Bill 1038. Please Thank do what is right for public education and our kids. Thank we you. need it. Thank you. Mr. Overcast, Cash, Gwen Meccolini, and Jackie Davidson. Good afternoon. My name's Commander David Overcash, United States Navy retired. I'm from Boise. I'm a Naval Academy and Naval War College graduate, but more importantly, I'm a lifelong learner and homeschool teacher. More than any other ideal, we need to cherish our freedom. Our heroes died for freedom, not lazy thinking, failed bureaucracy, and never ending spending. Politicians and media groups want to force children into the public system, and they still believe they know better than parents. You don't. As parents and educators for the last 20 years, my wife and I experienced all kinds of schools from Korea and Japan and Northern Virginia, and now being fed up with public schools homeschool. We cried with parents around the world as we've been dissatisfied with this horrible system. We've experienced teachers and encouraged drug use, heard neighbors share horrible experience of cyberbullying, et cetera. I will no longer tolerate a situation where my tax money embarked to my children is wasted. You are our servants and our advisors, not our masters. Give us our power and dollars and children back. They are ours, not yours. Thank you. Thank you. Gwen McEnany, Jackie Davidson, Matt Edwards. Chairman Lent and members of the committee, my name is Gwen McElhenney. I'm a 71-year-old, lifelong Idahoan who lives in Boise, and I've devoted my 45-year career as a speech-language pathologist advocating for the welfare of Idaho's children and youth. I'm here today to ask you to vote no on Senate Bill 1038. I'm skipping my background as an educator in this district at 13 different schools and in multiple districts, also charter, private, and parochial schools to tell you this morning, I met with 50 fellow senior citizens discussing the challenges facing education in Idaho. That This topic came up. How do you think these well-educated folks voted on whether or not we should divert public tax dollars for private education? It was unanimous. They all agree, even though they've come through parochial schools as I have, that public dollars should be for only public education. And a man who'd been the superintendent of the parochial schools in Idaho said, the right to choose on the part of parents for private education comes with the responsibility to pay for that choice. If you want to tithe for your education of your own children, that's fine. You may do so. Don't require me to do that as well, because the Blaine Amendment says we separate church and state in this Idaho. And by the way, that's in Idaho's best interest. Vote no on 1038. Thank you. Thank you. David, Jackie Davidson. Hi, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and um, committee members. My name is Jackie Davidson. I'm precinct committeeman uh, 1614. And I am here to uh, speak on the merits of Senate Bill 1038. Uh, I, I just want to say that last year there was a lot of talk about this. And we were all told that, oh, you know, there's nothing happening in the schools. There's no CRT. There's nothing nefarious going on. But now we're seeing that there are some ideologies going on in our uh, schools that are uh, the parents are find morally you know, detestable. Um, we're also seeing lower math scores. We're seeing English scores going down and just a reduced morality. So uh, parents are paying taxes for their children's education. We see many people pulling out their children out of these government schools and putting them in private schools to secure an honest and morally upright education. We're seeing private schools such uh, providing excellent education, yet parents have to pay double t 
taxes, and in tuition. So education savings account would provide a way for parents to educate their children in a manner that they want. And so with that, I would like to encourage the committee to send this bill to the Senate with a due pass vote. Thank you. As we get close to six, I look down through the list here. Um, I'm looking for people in person who may be here. Dominic, Brandon, are you here? Let me, uh, let me see who else is in here that's from a ways away. Steve Birch. Steve Birch, you're here. Um, Dale Lane. Oh, Dale, you can come back tomorrow. We'll just, we'll just say you will, okay? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Boise, Boise, Jerome, Cuna. Yes. Mr. Chair, for a quick question. Sure. Um, I just want to confirm, we will be voting on this tomorrow? It's our plan. Okay. I'm looking for any other I. Is there anyone in the audience, anyone else here, that's traveled here from outside the immediate area. Okay, so let's start with you three here. Um, would you identify your name and where you're from as you start, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dominic Brandon, Precinct Committeeman, uh, District 1010. Um, I am a homeschool father of three. Um, invested well over $100,000 into my wife's education to get a bachelor's degree as a um, as a teacher, essentially, and a farm to raise our three children. And um, I've just paid for all that with hard work over the years. If I would talk to any of you on the hall and asked you if I was free to homeschool my children in Idaho, I imagine you'd always say yes. But at what cost? I have chosen to alleviate the public school system the cost of three children, six, nine, and 11 years old, to be part of the community, to pay around $5,000 a year in property taxes, even more so in other taxes, and to be part of Idaho for several years and love this state and teach my children right from wrong and about cows and chickens and birds and all the reading, writing, and math and arithmetic and all that. But I'm paying extra to have that freedom, and I'm not using the public resources at the public school, so I'm alleviating that. So how much should I have to pay for that freedom to do what is right as a father for my kids. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, Steve Birch, Riggins. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Steve Birch from Riggins, Idaho. I'm in favor of this bill. 1038, the Freedom of Education Savings Accounts. Parents deserve a choice whether it be public, private, Christian, charter school, or home schools, which has to be included. Living in Riggins, home of the Salmon River School District 243, located in Idaho County, the largest county by area in the state, uh, from remote to rural. In Salmon River School District 243, they are showing 141 children enrolled with only 101 attending. There is 40 children being homeschooled. That's one third of the of the school. The students, from what I'm hearing, more students may have been withdrawn due to porn sites found on the counselor's website. With this bill, these parents could hire quality teachers in groups where the children could be able to be would be able to be well educated. The parents are doing a remarkable job with educating their children, but living in an area that depends on tourism, hunting, fishing, rafting, ranching, there is not a lot of full-time work. The bill would help all, even if they continue to teach at home with books, school supplies, online classes. With the committee's help, we can get all these children educated and graduated on to college and trade thank, schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Birch. We appreciate that very much. And thanks for driving down. Do I know how many more is left on here? Seven. Seventy. Okay. 
So it looks like we still have 70 on our list. So to you who have stayed around, especially those who have stayed online, uh, please accept our apologies and compliments for sticking it out. Um, tomorrow we'll be back at 3 o'clock. Uh, we will post the agenda here in just a few minutes, and then you'll be able to it'll probably take a half hour or so. Okay. We'll, we'll try to have it in just the next few minutes. So if you're at home or you're here, uh, you'll be able to go on and register again for tomorrow. We'll start again at 3 o'clock tomorrow. Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Senator Den Hartog. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, just for a clarification. So we'll be continuing the public hearing so that we can continue taking testimony. I just want to make sure, sometimes we do it a little bit differently, so I just want to make sure that's what we're doing. Yes, that would be our intent. Senator Herndon. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. How about if I'll just make it clear, I'll make a motion that sure, the motion committee go ahead and take up further testimony and consideration of Senate Bill 1038 tomorrow, Wednesday, February 15th at 3 p.m. It's been moved and seconded that we uh, uh, will dismiss for today. We'll come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. to continue our testimony with the end result, we hope, being able to vote on the bill tomorrow. And with that, we'll dismiss for today. Thanks again, everyone.